asking anyone or the other. Okay, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now the plan, if you know, was to be in what? Does anyone know the chapter we should be in? Yes? Good. 14. Good. You guys are listening? We should be in Luke 14. So let me explain why we're not going to be in Luke 14. Luke 14, like I said last week, way to go, uh, hits some tough stuff. Now, when I say that, you're like, oh, Isaac, like, just because it hits tough stuff, you shouldn't just, you know, veer the other way. And I'm not. We will get to Luke 14. I'm, the Lord is leading me to these other places right now, okay? Luke 14, we are going through Luke verse by verse, okay? Um, but Luke 14 hits some tough stuff because it gets into the cost of discipleship in a very powerful way, in a way that if we're not kind of prepared for it, it kind of like hits us like a semi, and we're like, yikes, what's going on here? He talks about putting Jesus above your business, putting Jesus above your very uh, family members. He talks about the banquets that we're going to have where some people are not going to be there. So there's lots of realities that go on in Luke 14 that if we're not just prepared in our heart and our mind, if we're just sort of like, you know, twirling our thumbs, thinking everything's fine, then we hit Luke 14, you're like, whoa, whoa, Jesus said what? I think it's important that we sort of just prepare our minds and our hearts before we hit some of those tougher uh, things of the cost of discipleship. Okay, so what I did last week was I felt, and I believe it was kind of the Spirit also leading me to be like, I got to preach on the love of God most primarily seen in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, because that is the way that God's love is perfectly, ultimately, uh, supremely demonstrated to us. Not just demonstrated, but this is love. By this we know love that he gave his life for us. So it's not just the demonstration of love, it is the essence of love. That self-sacrificial doing a work for the benefit of the other. And when you think about the cross, I mean, none of us deserve what Jesus did. God did, and giving up his son Jesus. None of us deserve it, and that's, what, that's why it's all of grace, right? Grace is undeserved blessing. Like, Isaac does not deserve what God has done through Christ at all, at all. And yet, just like we sang, he has shed the blood of his son Jesus for me. Is that atoning sacrifice? And I have been, you know, figuratively speaking, submerged into that blood and I have been cleansed. Um, and it's amazing. So we reflected on God's love uh, last week because we have to just see that God loves the world. He does. He loves the world. He loves us. And that's so essential. But one more thing is necessary, I believe. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, this is one of those verses that is a lot of time taken just out and put on posters and whatever, <laughs> things like that. And um, it's, it's kind of nice because this verse, um, it's kind of hard to, to take out of context. Um, and I'll read it. Uh, you, some of you know it. First, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we, ordinary we, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. When I say it's hard to take out of context, it's pretty easy to see that he's referring to the fact that we who are in Christ, united with Jesus, right? So any of us who have repented and believed in Jesus, we have become united with Jesus. I've talked about this before, and it's so important that, that what God did with Jesus on the cross did not just give us these sort of weird and personal spiritual bubbles of forgiveness and peace and love, and we don't, we don't just walk around with these sort of things. We receive him. Like, what God did is that we actually received Jesus Christ. It's in Christ Jesus. We are kind of grafted into him, right? He, we're grafted into his wounds. We've talked about this. He's, the, he's been wounded, and we're like branches that have been grafted into the Messiah, into Jesus Christ. So the reason why we experience forgiveness and peace and love and righteousness is because we're in the Prince of Peace. We're in the God of righteousness. We're in the way, the truth, and the life because we're in Jesus Christ. So we're united with him. That's amazing. I love it. I'm, I'm I got a tattoo on my arm. I regret this. This was a long time ago. Okay, back in 2014, like seven years ago or whatever, eight, eight years ago. Um, but I, at the time, I, I'm glad it wasn't anything else kind of weird, um, like an old girlfriend's name or something, but it's in Christ. Okay, to remind me, to remind me that I am grafted into Jesus um, Christ. It's so, so good. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we, ordinary we, our new creations in Christ. Behold, the old has passed away, the new has come. And this affects us to the core. It affects the old has passed away, the new has come. It affects us to our very core and outward, from the inside out. And let me give you an example of what it looks like when people really begin to live out who they are in Christ. Living out that reality of, okay, the old has passed away, the new has come, I'm united with Jesus, I'm a new creation in Christ with good works that God has called me to walk in. 
Here's an example. In Acts chapter 17, you have Paul and his companions, and they make their way to a place called Thessalonica, okay, which is in modern-day Greece. And they are there, and they begin to reason and dialogue and kind of argue with the Jews in the synagogue that Jesus was the Messiah, and that the Messiah had to die and rise again. So they begin to argue these things, and anyways, it just, they become an uproar. It becomes an uproar because Paul and his companions are new creations in Christ, and they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and it's creating an uproar in the city. And as some of you may know, in Acts 17, it literally says that they are accused of turning the world upside down. So you have a few people, and they, they go to the, um, the judges and the magistrates, and say, like, these guys over here, these, this Paul and these whatever crazies over here, they're turning the world upside down. What an accusation. I love it. I wish people would accuse me of that in the right way, right? I, I wish. That's awesome. And the reason why they're doing that is because when anyone's not in Christ Jesus, they are walking in the old person, and they're walking in the old system, the system that has been diseased from sin. They're not walking in Eden, so to speak. They're walking in Babylon. That's just the reality of the world. We looked at this last week. First John 5, 19 says that the whole world is under the power of the evil one. So it's just the old way. So when you have a man and a woman and a group that are new creations in Christ that have been delivered, they've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son, they are going to be different, right? They're living in the light. They're walking in the light. They're not walking in the darkness anymore. They're not living under the old system of things anymore. And therefore, they're kind of subverting the whole way of things. And they're turning the world upside down. I love it. So what kind of person is this? What kind of person can turn the world upside down? I believe it's just a normal, and I use that word on purpose, a normal disciple of Jesus. That's the kind of person that can turn the world upside down. A genuine but normal disciple of Jesus. Why? Because they're a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. The new has come. So what I believe, and I, we had a meeting with the elders this past week, and Richard actually said something that I, I took to heart today, Richard. So look, I'm taking your advice, and we need as a church, a, and individually, so as a church, but also individually, a fresh vision of who you are in Christ Jesus. You need a fresh vision of yourself as a disciple of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I need this every single day, and if you don't mind me saying, you need it too. You need a fresh vision of yourself in Christ Jesus. You see, discipleship, okay, is your life of following Jesus, learning from Jesus, imitating Jesus. That's discipleship, okay? If I was an uh, apprentice to a plumber, I would refer to my time of learning the trade as my apprenticeship, right? I got an apprenticeship. So what do I do? I, I go where my, whatever you call him, what do you call the, the main guy? Your boss, teacher, whatever, the head plumber. I follow him. He says, Isaac, tomorrow we got to meet in Richmond. I'm like, okay, I'll be there, right? I follow him. He, when we're down there, uh, he, you know, and I've read all the theories of it all, but now he's showing me what it actually looks like. He's teaching me. I'm imitating him. This is my apprenticeship. In the same way, you are a disciple, which means you are, you have a discipleship, right? Just like he, I had apprenticeship as a plumber, okay? That's your life as a disciple, following Jesus, learning from Jesus, imitating Jesus. And Luke 14, which we're going to get to, helps us understand the cost of it. There is a cost to play. Just like if I was an apprentice to a plumber, it, the cost is get up at 4 a.m. because you've got to be in Richmond by 5 or whatever it is. So there's a cost, right? But obviously the cost of the disciple is much deeper and much richer and much holistic of someone's life than apprenticeship, okay? But before the cost, I want us to see the reality of discipleship. It's like if I were to be a plumber, I want to, I want to just tell me, this is what it is to be a plumber. Like, this is how great it is. To, I don't know how great it is to be a plumber, but let's just pretend it's amazing. Like, this is what it is. Like, I want to show you how amazing it's going to be. I want to do that today with our disciple, the reality of being a true disciple of Jesus, one who's in Christ. Because here's my question. Could it be that you, me, us, could it be that we aren't flipping the world upside down because we've lost sight of who we are in Jesus? I would say, yeah. I say that lots of days I live my day sort of thinking that I'm all good with Jesus, and yet I'm really not living into who I am as a disciple of Jesus, and therefore there isn't that accusation put on me. Isaac, you're flipping the world upside down. But we want that. 
we want that. So today, we're going to be looking in a mirror, okay? In a mirror. And the mirror is not a physical mirror. It's the mirror of the Word of God. Because the Word of God tells us who we are in Jesus Christ. So we're going to look in that mirror today and actually see who we are, okay? And then you're going to turn away from that and you're going to live that out and not be like the man in James who just forgets who he is. You're going to look into the mirror. We're going to look into the mirror of the Word of God and we're going to see who we are as genuine disciples in Christ Jesus. Now, why John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23? This is a, the first resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ after he had died, okay, that he sees his disciples. So what happened in John chapter 20 is he rises again, okay, and uh, the two disciples, John and Peter, run to the tomb because they've heard that, um, that he wasn't there. They want to just confirm that that's reality. They go and they see, oh yeah, no one's here. They walk away. And you can imagine them like, whoa, what's going on here? He said he would rise again, and now he's not there. Interesting. So they're starting to believe. Their trains are starting to, to work. Yeah, the gears are working in their, in their head. Okay, but then Mary stays there. Okay, Mary, and some of you know the story. There's this man. She thinks he's the gardener. It's Jesus. Mary, he says, Rabbanai. She clings to him. Don't cling to me. Go tell my disciples. It's this amazing story. It's beautiful. Okay, and then the next account we have in John, or John chapter 20, is this first kind of communal uh, appearance of Jesus to his disciples. And I want to allegorically, which is a fancy word to say, I want to extract a few pieces of that historical story to kind of metaphorically apply to our situation. Okay, I want to allegorically see this uh, to help us see ourselves. But here's the goal for this morning. The goal is to excite you. That's my goal, and I hope by the Spirit that that happens. I want you to be excited for who you are in Jesus Christ. The last thing I want is for you to feel condemned and guilty that I'm not being a good disciple. No. Be excited about the potential of who you are. Not just the potential, who you are, what you can live out to be today. Because in doing that, if I can get us excited about who we are as disciples of Jesus, think about the glory that that would bring to the Father. He wants us to see and get excited about what He has done for us and in us through Jesus Christ. I mean, what else, right? It's like if I told my kids, if I told Primrose and Adoniram, hey, today we're going to go camping, and it was a surprise, I want them to get excited about it. I want them to be like, okay, whatever. It's like, no, get excited. This is exciting, you know? Um, so in the same way, God the Father, and that, that when, if they got excited, it would make me feel, oh, I feel like a good dad. And we want to do that to the Father. We want Him to feel and know the glory that He deserves from what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. So let's walk through this passage part by part together. And then I want us to pray and maybe pray like we'd never have before so that we would envision who we really are and live out that vision. Is everyone good to go? Okay, part one. And I've titled part one, Where Some of Us May Be. Where Some of Us May Be. Verse 19, we can read together. On the evening of that day... What is that day? That is the first day of the week. This is resurrection day. This is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, uh, Jesus came and stood among them. Let's, not, let's, just, let's just stop there, okay? This is resurrection day, okay? But at this point, Peter and John are kind of suspicious of what's going on, but just the general kind of feeling is one of fear. Their leader, the one they thought that was the Messiah, and they were right, he was the Messiah who they thought was going to be able to trample over the Romans and set up an earthly Jewish kingdom. That guy that they thought was going to do all that died, like a really cruel death, a death that not even Roman prisoners would die on. It was like, except if it was treason. It, it was the worst cruel mocking death wasn't even allowed to be in Jerusalem, was outside the walls of Jerusalem. Just terrible, terrible death. That was their king, they thought, and they were discouraged. And now, because it was the Jews, the religious leaders of the day, that killed their leader, killed their Messiah, they're like, well, what if they come for this leader's followers, right? So they are hiding. They're hiding in a room. They've locked the door. They've gone in. They've put the bolt across the door, and they are they don't know what they're doing. They're just in there, and they are in fear. That's what the, it says. For fear of the Jews, this is where they uh, were, and this is the reality of where they were. Allegorically speaking, church, some of us may 
knowingly or unknowingly, consciously or unconsciously, some of us may be locked in a room with these disciples right now. Okay? What I mean by that is, you may be in a room, figuratively speaking, in fear. In fear of living out the life of the resurrected Jesus in you out there in the real world. So maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've heard me preach about it before. Maybe you've seen something online or whatever of disciples living out who they are. And you're like, my goodness, I could never imagine doing something like that. And you are keeping yourself back. You've locked the door in fear. That could be one of the reasons why you're locked into a room. Some of you, though, may feel unqualified. You're like, there's no way. I I haven't even read the whole Bible. Some of you maybe have not read the whole Bible. Maybe you're like, I don't pray enough. I don't do this enough. I don't do that enough. I still have these friends that are like really sucking the life out of me. Who knows? And you feel unqualified. You're like, I can't really live into who I am as a disciple because I'm just not there yet. Okay? I'm just not there yet. Some of you may feel this. Some of you, though, might feel that you're looking around in the room, you're like, this is discipleship, like this is life, right? You've never really been exposed to something more, or if you have, you're like, oh, that's too crazy, that's, that's not real, that can't be real. But this is discipleship, I go to church every Sunday, I, you know, I have a good, you know, bank account, it's nice, I give to the church, I tithe, I, I don't swear, I don't spit, I just, you know, I'm just a good moral person. Some of you think that that's discipleship, and you can do that in that locked room all your life. So some of you may be kind of unknowingly, unconsciously locked in this room, but I think it's important to know that it's not locked from the outside, it's locked from the inside, and this is what's, where it's exciting. By the end of today, you can, figuratively speaking, unlock that door and walk out because you don't need to be in fear. You are qualified because it's not about you. In fact, God works through our weaknesses to demonstrate his power. Amazing. It's the best one of the biblical teachings there is, okay? And get out of that room because there's so much more to the life of Christ than a stinky, dusty, musty room. You can get out and see the world. So, have you locked yourself in a room? Do you feel like you're not living out the potential of who you are in Christ as a disciple? Maybe some of you are. I can feel this even though I'm an elder here. Yes, I can feel those ways. I want to be out and experience what it is to live as uh, a disciple. Part number two, Jesus is with us, okay? Verse 19, doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. What happens though? Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Okay, so the disciples are in fear. They're locked in a room. They've locked themselves in the room, right? Then Jesus just shows up. Now, Jesus, the point he makes when he says, feel my, my," like, he's in flesh. He's in his resurrected physical body. So it doesn't really matter if you feel like he, like, you know, just translucently, like, kind of went through the door. I probably think he just was able to unlock it and walk through because he's still a physical body, but he's the resurrected Jesus. He can do whatever he'd like, but whatever the case is, he gets through. And what's amazing about that is that he can meet you where you're at right now. That's huge. No matter what, no matter what kind of barriers you've put up in your life, he can just come in because he's king, okay? You can't say no to him. He'll do what he does. He's irresistible that way. So he came in. He just walked into the room. And what's the first word that he speaks to them? Peace. Shalom peace. Now listen, yes, this was a greeting at the time, right? Shalom, shalom, right? It's a greeting. But when Jesus speaks, he doesn't just say greetings like, well, hey, how you doing? Oh, not too bad. Like, that's just nothing. I don't, Brittany, my wife, hates that kind of talk. She's like, it's never real. You ask someone, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. It's like, no, you're not. Tell me what's really going on. It's, this isn't just this, you know, social etiquette greeting. When Jesus speaks, he speaks the truth. So when he says, peace be with you, it really means peace be with you not just yo, it's peace be with you, okay? This is declaration, a declaration to them from the one who breathed the world into existence of all that he is and all that he's done for them from the past, present, and the future, peace from the Prince of Peace. Peace be with you. He said earlier in John chapter 14, verse 27, he told them, kind of promised them, peace I leave with you peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. What does that mean? Don't listen to all those miss whatever 
North Carolina with world peace because not as the world gives do I give to you. They can't give the kind of peace that Jesus gives, but Jesus gave true peace. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus promised, neither let them be afraid. So what does he mean when he talks about peace? Well, I mean, we could spend so long here, but let me just quickly break it down into three things. Peace with God. When Jesus came and said, peace be with you, he's reminding them and proving to them and showing them that, yes, once you were totally at enmity with the Father because of your sins, there was a chasm bigger than infinity that separated you from God. But through Jesus, that hostility has been shattered and you now have peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, since you've been justified by faith, you've been made righteous through Jesus, counted righteous, you have what with God? Peace with God. God. That's something that we celebrate. You can walk with God today. That's amazing. That's amazing. One of your sins against him separated you from him for eternity. And yet now you have peace with that God. That is amazing. The second part of peace is that you have peace with one another. In the first century, the biggest issue that the church had to face was a racial issue, much like today. A racial issue. Jews not Jews, fighting, right, all the time. And yet the gospel is not just for the Jews, it's for the Jews first, but also to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. So much of the writings of the New Testament had to do with how do we make the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians get along? Well, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says, Jesus is your peace who have made you, you can imagine him like pulling this Jewish Christian, and you Gentile, one new person. Therefore, dividing this wall of hostility. It's amazing. I love it. The church ought to be a place where it's just unity, right? Just there's so much unity. There's so much peace. Jesus is our peace that brings us uh, together, no matter what. Racial, statuses, ethnicities, whatever it is. But lastly, more generally, the peace that he declares to them is just the peace of the kingdom of God. That Garden of Eden kind of peace. The peace where you can just walk with God. No fear. Walk with God. Know God. Be with God. Eat what God gives you to eat. Share what God gives you to share. It's just, it's, it's, it's heaven. It's the peace of heaven that we get to experience because we have been transferred in the kingdom and because Jesus has declared peace to us. So peace, just like I said earlier, peace is not just some impersonal kind of fluffy thing that comes down and, and rests on us. It's, it's all wrapped up in Jesus it's Jesus. It's Jesus we receive. He is the Prince of Peace, right? Isaiah 9, he's the Prince of Peace that we receive. Philippians 4 verse 7 says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So it's the peace of God which comes in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus is a phrase, in Christ, in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, that you'll, it's all throughout the New Testament to remind us it's all because you're united in Jesus. It's all because you're united in Jesus. So when we pray for someone that's not a Christian, we pray, oh God, let your peace come upon them. That's okay to pray. I'm not saying don't pray for that, but pray that they'd be saved. Pray that they would be united with Jesus because that's the only way that they're going to really experience true and lasting peace. So fellow disciples, I want you to know, you have peace because you have Jesus. He's yours. Take him, feel him, walk in him. Walk in true peace. So I want you to envision, because remember, the whole purpose of today is just to get a fresh vision of who you are in Jesus. This is the true you. You have peace. You have peace. It's not a matter of feelings. It's a matter of fact. You have peace. Envision the confidence that you have, the boldness that you have, the uh, the ability to suffer well, because nothing can cause you just to get discouraged in a swamp of chaos and discord, because you have peace as a fact, not as a feeling, as a fact. Let your feelings come in line with your, the facts, not the other way around, okay? This is all because the peace of Christ is with you. He is with you. Jesus is. You see, in believing the gospel, church, we understand that we are united with Jesus, and he has promised to never leave us. Matthew 28, 20, I will never leave you. I'm with you always to the very end of the age, which means what? Peace is with you always to the very end of the age. Always. It's amazing. So after saying this uh, to his disciples, he proved who he was by showing his wounds. Hey, guys, look, right? If it was in the hands, if it was in the hands, then they, he would have to have like a rope tied around his um, arm if, when he was on the cross because if it was his hands, it would just rip off. So some people believe that it was probably like in the, in the forearm if there was no actual uh, rope 
uh, tied around, but it could have been either way. But the reality is, wherever the hole was, he's like, guys, check it out. Look at the holes. Look at the side, right, where I was pierced. He proves to them that he is who he is, right? Because they're a little bit confused. Like, he, he's in his resurrected body, so I, my interpretation is that when Mary didn't quite recognize him, when they're fishing in the boat back in John, or later in John 21, and there's like, that's Jesus, and they go, and it says no one dared ask him who he was because they knew he was the Lord. I mean, think of the effects that sin just generally has on our bodies, but this is the resurrected body of Jesus, so there must have been something a little bit unusual, just a little bit, just to cause him to be like, oh, what's going on here? Is that, yes, it is Jesus, and the nail prints and the wounds in his side and his hands prove to us that this truly is our Lord. This is Jesus Christ, and of course, this makes them glad. I mean, this is their Messiah. He's risen from the dead, and now they're like, I get it now. He's been telling us that he's going to die and rise again. We never got it. Here it is. We get it, but what about us who don't see? It's a great question. I mean, Carrie and Grant, like we haven't seen him, right? In that way, he hasn't stood before us in a physical resurrected body because he's ascended, right? He's ascended to the right hand of the Father in the highest heavens, and one day he's coming back. But we haven't seen him like they got to see him, but here's what I'll tell you. We get an amazing blessing that they didn't get. In John chapter 20, verse 29, you can see Jesus said to him, to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Church, there is a way to see the resurrected, wound-printed Jesus with eyes of faith. And when we do that, when we see him with the eyes of faith, there's a blessing incurred. There's a blessing, there's a reward that we get that Thomas never gets to experience. And that's pretty amazing. That's pretty uh, amazing. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, so we can look with eyes of faith on the resurrected Jesus Christ, even now. We can look upon him. We can see his wounds. We can see his side, and we can be glad just like them. This is the way that the New Testament thought it could be with eyes of faith. In fact, when Paul was writing to the church of Galatia, this is in Galatians 3.1, he was frustrated with them because the church in Galatia were moving on to things that were outside of the gospel that Paul preached, so he's getting frustrated with them. But at one point in Galatians 3 verse 1, he says, this is what Paul says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, do you think all of the church in Galatia, was, which was up in modern day Turkey, was all there present at the cross in Jerusalem? like 20, 30 years earlier, looking at Jesus? No. And yet Paul's saying it was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul is saying that when he first preached and declared the gospel to the church, it was so vivid, so real, so powerful that they saw with eyes of faith the crucified Jesus. Isn't that amazing? He's saying you saw him. So stop walking away from him because you saw him with eyes of faith. Later on in in 2 Timothy, uh, when Paul is writing to Timothy, the last letter that we have of Paul before he is beheaded, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8, he encourages Timothy. What does he tell Timothy? Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The offspring of David is preached in my gospel. Now, I know it says remember. He's not saying see Jesus, but I, I don't really see this massive difference. Remember, look. Look at the risen Jesus, Timothy. Remember him. And I believe that's the same thing that we can say to each other. Hey, like, Mike, look at the risen Jesus Christ. Look at the wounds in his hands. He loves you, Mike. Like, keep going. Remember him. You've seen him crucified when the gospel is preached, and you've seen him resurrected when the gospel is preached. You can see him. So my encouragement to us is, like, look at him. Look at him with those eyes of faith. Trust that Jesus himself gives you a blessing to those who believe without, without the naked sight that we don't get. But one day we will. Praise the Lord. Two things come from seeing him with eyes of faith. Number one, we figuratively see his wounds and we remember his loving sacrifice for us. Isn't that amazing? And guess what? Those wounds will last forever. In fact, it was a brother, Bill Badke, who's probably watching online uh, right now, uh, where he reminded me a little while ago that when we're millions of years in the new heavens and the new earth, the Lamb of God will still have his wound prints the lamb that was slain. We'll still see that because that proves the great love and the power of him for us. 
So that's the first thing. When we see him with eyes of faith, we remember, oh, he loves me that much. And the second thing is we see that though he died, he yet lives. And he is the beginning of the first fruits, the first fruits of the new creation. And that, he, that promises us, and that gives us the assurance that one day we will rise with him, which is awesome. So disciples, this same Jesus, okay, is not only with you, he is in you. He is united with you, Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, okay? As it says in multiple places in scripture, we are in Christ Jesus. So Listen, envision who you are as a disciple of Jesus. You have the peace of God, you have the love of God, and you have the grace of God because you have God. You have Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. He is with you. In fact, Paul can say to the Colossians, in all truth, Colossians 3, 4, Christ is your life. Like, who says that? Christ is your life. And yet it is. It is he is our life. So envision this. This is you. Not who you could be if you tried hard, if you went to seminary, if you came to church every Sunday. This is who you are right now if you have believed in Jesus as your Savior. This is you right now. question is, are you going to live that out? Just like the disciples were glad when they saw this Jesus, we can be glad all the time because Jesus isn't just with us at the beginning, he's with us forever. Part number three, Jesus has sent us. This is so good. Verse 21, uh, it says this. Jesus said, again, said to them again, peace be with you. So, pff, declaration of peace. Then he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Just like these disciples, church, you have been selected, or maybe more biblically speaking, elected, okay, for a mission from Jesus himself. Okay, let that just sit for a moment. You have been selected for a mission. What is that mission? Well, ultimately speaking, if we kind of sum up what we're to do, it is to declare, to demonstrate the good news of the kingdom that has come in Jesus Christ. This is what it is to make disciples. This is the commission that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. It's the commission that we see in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole creation. What we read in Luke 24, 47, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You, disciple, okay, have been sent from Jesus. You are a sent one to declare and to demonstrate the kingdom of God that has come in Jesus Christ. That is your mission. That is your goal. And I want you to understand the personal reality of this, because if we look at it just merely as this communal church thing, then it will be really easy for us to be like, oh, okay, cool, that's the church thing. I'm just going <laughs> to step back here, right? Because I couldn't do that. I can't speak like he does or she does. I couldn't do those things. I don't have the boldness that that person does. Or have you seen, like, they, they fasted for 40 days. I could never do that. And, like, you know, all these things come into our, our, our brain. So it's really easy for us to kind of shift off into the shadows when we kind of see it as just a big church goal. But understand that the church is full of individual Christians, and it makes up. We're all bricks in the one kingdom of God, and you have a part to play. And it's your goal. It is your mission as well. Here's an illustration to kind of help you make the point. Imagine if we were it's, it's 1300, okay, and we're somewhere in England, and um, I'm a king of a kingdom, and you're all civilians, in my peasants, okay, and uh, imagine if I declared a new tax, okay, that all of you had to pay a new tax, okay, now, if that's the case, I guarantee that Catherine, I'm going to pick on you for a moment, I guarantee that Catherine's not going to be like, oh, I have a special, unique, personal goal from the king, I get to pay a tax, this is amazing. I feel so fulfilled. I'm a sent one. I have been sent to pay the taxes to my king. I guarantee she, is that right? Yeah, she's nodding her head. She would not feel that way. But imagine instead if I caught word as a king of a, my kingdom, if I caught her word, uh, wind, that there's another kingdom, a rival kingdom that is looking to attack us. And I start thinking about, oh man, okay, well, what do I do? I could send my powerful army, but I just, they, they're going to expect that, so maybe I'll try something else. Okay, who, okay, oh, oh, hey, Catherine, I know Catherine, because I'm a good king, and I know my people, right? Catherine, okay, here's her strengths, here's her weaknesses, okay, okay, I'm going to, and I come up to you, and I say, Catherine, I have a special mission for you. I'm going to send you undercover, but it's not going to be dangerous, because I'm going to have my men there, just ready. If anything happens, they're going to be ready to protect you, but I have a special mission for you, specifically for you to go and to solely subvert and mess up their plans, and I'm choosing you. And it's okay if you don't feel strong, if you don't have big muscles or whatever, this is nothing on you, Catherine, but I'm just like, 
I, I know that you might feel like you don't have all the strength, but in fact, it's going to be better if I send you out in your weakness, in your trembling, because I'll work my power through your weakness in a way that they're not going to expect it. Guys, this is the whole purpose of the church. Paul literally tells the Corinthians, God says through Paul, like, I didn't choose you because you're the wisest. I didn't choose you because you had the big biceps. I didn't choose you because of that. I chose you because you were nothing in the world so that I could use what's foolish in the world to despise the wise, what's weak in the world to despise the strong. We can celebrate and rejoice in our weaknesses. But anyways, in that situation, Catherine, you would feel honored. You're like, wow, like, I'm not just someone that has to pay taxes. I, God has chosen me. That's the reality of our selection, of us being sent. God has looked upon each one of us and said, I know who you are. You're not just a civilian in my kingdom and I'm going to tyrannically just make you do things I want you to do. I know who you are and I know your strengths and I know your weaknesses and I've chosen you to declare and to demonstrate the kingdom of God and I'm going to help you. And you, we together are going to crush the, the serpent. Well, Jesus is going to do that. But uh, the church plays a role. The word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb will destroy the enemy. So don't worry about weakness, church. He desires to demonstrate his strength through your weakness. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Listen to Paul's words when he's speaking to the Corinthians. He says, he's recollecting on when he met them in person. This is a letter he sends later, right? He says, when I came to you guys, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with his lofty speech, lofty wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when I was with you and Sorry, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom. Maybe he stuttered. Maybe he said things that, you know, at the time, just especially in that Greek, you know, they highly emphasized this rhetoric, perfect rhetoric, the philosophers, all that kind of stuff. He came like, nah, I was, they were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And what's his reason? So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men or the strength of men, but in the power of God. That's just amazing. Praise the Lord. That means all of us are qualified because it's in our weakness. So I want you to see the vision, church, of who you are as one who has been sent by Jesus to declare and demonstrate the kingdom come in Jesus. That's who you are. You have been commissioned by the king. Part number four, Jesus has breathed the spirit of God upon us. Are we okay? I know this is a lot right now. Barry's like, I don't know. Um, Part four, let's just do this. Verse 22, okay? And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. We'll press on the gas here, okay? Disciple, in your potential fear, or whatever it is that's keeping you back from living as who who you truly are, you're still locked in that little musty room with the disciples, okay? I want you to know that Jesus himself has breathed on you. And I hope... I don't need to say that the breath of God is very effective. This word breathed on in the New Testament is only used once, and then it's used also in the Old Testament in very important times. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, you have God forms the man in the dust, and then what? Genesis 2, verse 7, then Yahweh God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed, same word, into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So there's an enlivening, vibrant reality that happens when the breath of God is breathed upon someone. And Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10. I was going to read it all, but I won't read it all right now, but you, some of you know what it is. You have Elijah, valley of bones, dry bones. There's no way these are going to come to life. But God says, prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. And all of a sudden, the same word, the breath through the prophecy of God came and sinews and muscles, and then they became living beings. All the valley of dry bones became alive because the breath of God through the prophetic word caused them to be alive. It's amazing. As one commentator says, Jesus breathed into the disciples the breath of the new creation that gave them spiritual vitality. You see, Jesus promised, just like John the Baptist said, I'll baptize you with water for the remission of your sins. But the one who comes after me, Jesus, he's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit. The word baptize is to immerse, completely submerge. That's why we fully immerse. We don't just do a little sprinkling. We say, no, you're going down because you're going to be all fully submerged in the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why they use the word baptizo, not sprinklizo. It's, it's baptizo, like be completely submerged because the Holy Spirit is going to engulf you. You're going to be totally full of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. In Acts 2, verse 33, after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, the first act 
of the risen king on the right hand of the throne of God was what? To send the spirit. To send the spirit. In Acts 2.33, Peter explains the wonder of the tongues, right? By saying to the confused listeners, he said, Jesus being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing in here. He's poured out the Spirit. And you see it with your eyes because it does something. It's not just, oh, I have the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to keep living my life the way that I always do. It's like the Holy Spirit will affect you. It'll do something in you. Disciple, Jesus has breathed on you. And what is that breath? It's the very presence and power of God. Do you understand what that means? Maybe this will help. Jesus, being the Son of God, did not take advantage of his divinity, his Son of Godness, while on earth. But he totally became a human with all of the weaknesses and issues that humans have, yet without sin. He never not, didn't become God. He was always God, but he did not take advantage. He emptied himself. He did not take advantage of his divinity. Therefore, what does this mean? He relied on the anointing of the Holy Spirit that the Father gave him to fulfill his mission. To fulfill his ministry. I have a whole bunch of texts here. I won't go through them all, but it proves that it was always Jesus filled with the Spirit. Jesus healed because the power that was within him. Jesus anointed with the Holy Spirit, proclaimed. It was all because the Spirit. He depended on the Holy Spirit. Why? So that he would be a model for us. Because how easy is it for us to look at Jesus and say, like, oh, he's Jesus. I could never do what he did. Jesus is like, the whole point of me coming down was to show you who you are. <laughs> in depending on the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean for us? But that the same Spirit that Jesus now breathed on us, who has anointed us with, is for us to continue His ministry, for us to continue His ministry. Jesus expects that we continue His ministry. In John 14, 12, He says, whoever believes in me will do the same works that I do, and greater works they will do, because I'm going to the Father. Why is that important? Because when I go to the Father, I get to send the Holy Spirit down upon you. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Listen to what one commentator says who did a huge study on this. I may have already quoted this, but you've got to hear it again because it's so good. The significance of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus extends to his followers in all the little and the big things of their existences. The Spirit that helped Jesus overcome temptations, that strengthened him in weakness, that aided him in the hard job of taking on himself the hurts of the hurting, that infused him with a power to accomplish the impossible, that enabled him to stay with and complete the task God had given him to do, that brought him through death and into resurrection, is the spirit that the resurrected Jesus has freely and lavishly given to those who would be his disciples today. You got to read that every morning. I got to read that every morning. It's like, really? Yes. Envision this reality of the true you, church. You have been breathed on by Jesus with the spirit of God. But look at what Jesus says to his disciples. This is in verse 22b. He says, when he had said this, he breathed on, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. There's two actions here. There's one by Jesus and there's one by you, right? Jesus breathed on them, okay? That's something that he did. That's his will. And they, we, are commanded to receive. That's an imperative in the Greek tense, meaning you receive the Holy Spirit. <sighs> Breathe, Jesus, me, receive. Receive the Spirit. We play Apart, and again, I'm going to quote this guy, Hawthorne, again. He says, just as Jesus remained master of his will and consciousness, yet nevertheless deliberately chose to subject himself to the guiding influence of the Spirit through his life and thus lived powerfully and triumphantly, so his followers, you, me, okay, North Valley, so his followers must do as he did if they would experience the same power and triumph in their own personal experiences. The choice is theirs. The choice is yours, church, to receive the Spirit or not, to subject yourself to the Spirit's leading or not. So my encouragement to you, my encouragement to me, receive the breath of God. Receive the person of the Trinity, the Spirit of God. You are, it's not who you could be, church. You are one who has been breathed on. You are already one who has been breathed on. You are one who has within you the capability to fulfill God's mission for you. The crazy mission that we sent Catherine on that's pretty scary but crazy and amazing, she can do it because the Holy Spirit gives her the supernatural power and ability. Paul tells, the, uh, tells us in uh, Ephesians 3.20 that God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work. Where? Within us. He can do more than we can ask or think according to the Holy Spirit's power at work already present in us. 
This is you. This is me. This is me in Christ. This is who I truly am. Part five, we're almost done. We have, this is part five, we have the greatest power the world could ever know. Verse 23, listen to this, so good. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. How is that the greatest power ever? I'll tell you, it's so good. You and I, okay, uh, nor the 12 disciples, none of us have the power in and of ourselves to pronounce forgiveness to anyone. We can't tell someone like our friends over at St. Joseph's that, you know, you have been totally like, there's some power within us that we can pronounce and declare because of our power any kind of forgiveness or absolution or anything like that. That's not what this is about. Rather, included in our mission, and remember our mission is the Father has sent me, I sent you, so that's the mission. Included in our mission, that's only power possible by the power of the Spirit, we have the power and the privilege, church, to be the gatekeepers, so to speak, of the kingdom of God. What do I mean by that? When I declare the gospel, when I share the gospel with a family member or with a group or whatever, when I declare the gospel, I am, figuratively speaking, without putting any uh, emphasis on me, like a key that I'm giving all of my hearers in that moment, whether it's one person or many, the key now to walk into the kingdom. Yes, whose work is it really to save? The Holy Spirit. We know that. The Spirit regenerates. The Spirit gives life. Okay, I just cast my nets. But in casting my nets, I'm given the opportunity for the Spirit to do work, for that person to walk through that kingdom door into healing, to peace, into salvation, into eternal life. When I share the gospel, church, the door is ready to be open for anyone to come in and experience the healing, the forgiveness, the power of eternal life with God. If one enters, I can declare as an ambassador, as a representative of Jesus himself, that he or she is forgiven. I can declare it in truth. And if they don't enter, they refuse to repent, they refuse to believe, they refuse to stay in their old ways, then I can declare as an ambassador, as a representative of Jesus, that he or she is still in their sins and warn them. Shake off the dust of my feet, just like Jesus taught his disciples to when he sent them out. If anyone doesn't receive you, shake off the dust of their feet. That's amazing power. That's crazy power. I ne you never think of it that way, but it's true. That power is amazing. What greater power and privilege is there in this universe? Of course, God is sovereign by the Spirit to regenerate hearts. We know that. We've already said it. But you and I, figuratively speaking, are the key to the door of the kingdom that others can take and enter into. So envision this, disciples. I mean, think of it. The cure for cancer, the science of space travel, the bioethical equation that extends human life 100 years, the perfect concoction of energy that preserves the planet, whatever. None of these things are even close to the power that we hold as spirit-filled representatives of Jesus. None of those things could even get close to the power that we hold. So here's my conclusion. Disciples, it's time for us to unlock the door of the house that we're hiding in, for whatever reason that might be, and to come out to boldly live as we truly are. Guess what? Those 11 disciples that were all huddled up there, actually, it was actually 10 because Thomas wasn't there and Judas went his own way. There's 10 of them. Did they stay in that room? No, they went out. We're all evidence that they actually left the room. We're all evidence. If they stayed in that room, nothing would have happened. It would have just stuffed like a little uh, candle. You just you know, but no, they came out of that room, praise the Lord, and you can come out of that room too and boldly live as you truly are, and who are we? Just a quick reminder, those united with the king, king of peace, king of love, who died for us, the king of victory that has, the death has no say over. We are those who are sent, not sent to go to church on Sunday. What a boring mission that would be just to go to church on Sunday. That's discipleship. Go to church. No, no, but sent as Jesus was sent, sent to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, sent to demonstrate his power, his love, his righteousness to all nations. We are those who personally and specifically are breathed upon by Jesus himself, submerged into the spirit of God, breathed upon. The very presence and power of God rests in us, church. He empowers us, just as Jesus was empowered, to defy human limitations and see the kingdom come in power and truth. And we are those who hold in our mouths, I'll say, the greatest power that exists in the universe. Because as ambassadors and representatives of Jesus, we have the delegated authority and power to open and close the kingdom doors to people by our word. Preaching the gospel. This is you. If you're a believer. If you're not a believer, this is not you. But you could be this today. 
But if you are a believer, this is you. Not who you could be. This is you now. If even a few disciples in every, you know, church, let's say, caught this vision in themselves, which really is the vision of Jesus, since he is our life, if even a few disciples caught the vision of themselves, the world would begin to have to respond to this power. Some will respond by entering in and experiencing the love and the power of God through Jesus. Others will accuse us, flipping the world upside down. They will persecute us to death because we're trampling on the demonic agendas of this world. So let this excite you. You are more than you think because of Christ in you. This isn't a guilt trip, okay? This is a glorious motivator and encourager that you would see who you are and live it. I'm going to finish with this quote that both really excites me and also angers me. And now, um, this is from a book called I Believe in Discipleship, written by a man named David Watson in England. This is back in the 80s. He wrote this book, and he, he gave this quote, and I, I just love it. And uh, I'll tell you why I love it after. This is what he says. A communist once threw out this challenge to a Western Christian. So this is a communist speaking to a Western Christian. Communist says to the Christian, the gospel is a much more powerful weapon for the renewal of society than is our Marxist philosophy. But all the same, it is we communists who will finally beat you. We communists do not play with words. We are realists. And seeing that we are determined to achieve our object, we know how to obtain the means. How can anybody believe in the supreme value of this gospel of yours if you do not practice it, if you do not spread it, and if you sacrifice neither time nor money for it? We believe in our communist message, and we are ready to sacrifice everything, even our life. But you people are afraid to soil your hands. Is that not a powerful quote or what? And that excites me. I don't want that to be some like guilt trip on us. That excites me. So why does it excite me? Because, well, first of all, the power of the gospel is greater than anything, and this communist confirms that, okay? He's like, yeah, if that's true, then it's way more powerful than everything, right? But this, this quote excites me because what if we, what if me, what if I begin to live into the vision of who I really am in Christ, and what if I began to soil my hands? What if we began to get dirty with the world in that sense, soil our hands, begin to move, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So moving doesn't mean in a worldly way. It means moving in the spiritual realm. We begin to pray. We begin to preach. We begin to share. We begin to share the love of Jesus in a powerful, powerful way. What would happen? What would God do if his sons and daughters began to get their hands soiled because they finally have come to the realization, the vision of who they are as spiritual gardeners? They're like, this is who I am. This is who I am. I'm going to do this. So be encouraged, church. Come out of the locked room. Christ is with you. His Spirit is in you. You have nothing to fear, only to rejoice. Walk in the breath of the Spirit and experience life as you never have. And I'll come with you.